I have three Sundays with you before I take some leave in May and when I looked at the lectionary for these three Sundays I was reminded of a story that I know I've told you before um, but here goes again um, a story about a preacher who stood up to preach and said just three words um, and then sat down again these words were love one another the people in the pews who had big plans for Sunday lunch were pretty happy with this turn of events that gave them an extra 20 minutes to get everything ready. But when she did the same thing the following week, stood up, said love one another and sat down, a few people started to reconsider their offerings because, well, clearly they were not getting their money's worth out of this preacher. And um, when she did the same thing the third Sunday in a row, the congregation formed a delegation to confront her. What's going on here, they shouted. You're supposed to be teaching us about Jesus, but all we ever hear from you is these three words. And she said, hmm, yeah, I see your point. Um, can you remind me what those three words were again? Of course we can, they said. It's all we've heard from you for three weeks. Love one another. Excellent, she said. Now, when I see you doing that, I'll move on to something else. Well, today and for the next two Sundays, the lectionary brings us into this beautiful convergence between the first letter of John and the Gospel of John. And what do you get when you combine one John and the Gospel of John? You get sisters and brothers love one another love one another. Just get on with it. Love one another. Oh, for goodness sake, you have one job. Love one another. Over and over again, at various levels of intensity and frustration. Um, well, that's what you get when you combine 1 John and the Gospel of John. So that's the plan for the next three weeks. Love one another. Now, it is hard to be certain about exactly who wrote most of the books of the Bible and that's because we're dealing with seriously ancient writings and uh, because people in those cultures had different ideas from us about intellectual property. And in this case also because John was a common name back then as it is now. So it may or may not be that 1 John and the Gospel of John were written by the same person. Regardless, they do have themes very much in common. Love, of course, is very big in both of them, as it is in all of scriptures, in fact. Light and truth are also big themes in both the letter and the gospel. And, and those three, love, light and truth, are interconnected in beautiful and creative ways in the letter and the gospel. But love one another. You don't get far through the gospel or the letter without being told to do that. It is as simple as that and as difficult as that. And it is difficult, don't you find? Both the letter and the gospel acknowledge that it is difficult. How is it to be done? Both gospel and letter are clear. We can do it because Jesus has done it. We can love each other because Jesus has loved us first. But what does that mean? How is it that Jesus' great acts of love, his death and resurrection, enable and empower us to love? as the letter and the gospel claim? Well, that's a big question, isn't it? One of the biggest questions for us to consider as followers of Jesus. Um, and with Holy Week still fresh in our minds, this is the right time to be asking ourselves that question. And it is not a rhetorical question when I ask you. I'm asking you to seriously 
think about the, how the events of Holy Week have made you better at loving the people around you. Now you might like to turn off the video and think about that for a while. As you remember the foot washing, the praying, the trial, the death, and then the resurrection, do those things, just bringing those things to mind, help you be better at loving the people, especially people who are hardest to love. When you see a stranger who needs help and you think you don't have the time or the resources to help them, does remembering Jesus enable you to put aside your own agenda in order to be there for them? When someone from your family is demanding more from you than you are able to give, does remembering Jesus give you the wisdom and strength that you need to know and to do the most loving thing in that situation? And it, like the most loving thing may be saying yes or it may be saying no. When you see that person at church who you cannot stand, now, we don't have anyone like that at St Paul's, of course, but you can, you can imagine. Now, when you see that person, does remembering Jesus help you to take a deep breath and enter into a real conversation with that person? And when someone cuts you off in traffic, does remembering Jesus help you let it go and not retaliate? What difference has Easter made to your capacity to love? You see, it's easy to talk about love in beautiful theoretical language that never touches our real life. And it is also easy to use the language of love to justify our own selfishness. C.S. Lewis in uh, Screw Tape Letters famously wrote, She's the sort of woman who, love, who lives for others. And you can tell those others by the haunted expression. John will have none of that. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? That cuts through all of our nonsense and all of our excuses. John will say to us, you reckon you're a loving person? Well, look over there. There's someone who's hungry or lonely or abused. Their presence in your community is a testimony to your lack of love. And that's pretty much what all of the Old Testament prophets said as well. You see, when you start to get real and practical about love, then it doesn't take long for us to go from, oh, isn't that nice, to, oh, crikey, I have really messed up. And so John moves quickly with us to talk about what to do when our hearts condemn us. Because let's be honest, our hearts do condemn us all in this matter, at least sometimes at least if we have good hearts. So we need to talk about anatomical metaphors for a minute. We tend to assume that all cultures use the same metaphors, the same images. Um, for us, hearts mean emotion, affection, romance even. The heart emoji is a universal language, is it not? Well, as it turns out, no, it is not. The first century um, Greek speakers, for them, the heart was not about emotion. That's what the guts were for. The heart was a metaphor for the will. The heart was the center of a person's identity. They would speak about the heart pretty much in the same ways that we speak about the head. And that can get confusing, of course, but reading the Bible is a cross-cultural exercise so of course it gets confusing so when when John talks about our hearts condemning us 
over the quality of our loving, he's not talking about feelings. He's saying something much more substantial. If our heart is the centre of our will, of our very selves, and our self is condemning our own actions, then that speaks of a divided self, does it not? Which is a sorry state to be in, but it is also a hopeful state. More hopeful than if our hearts didn't care at all about our lack of love. In our behaviour, we fall short, all of us. And if our hearts were to say, no worries, that's fine. Let everyone else starve. As long as I'm okay, it's all good. If we had hearts like that, then we would have a real problem. But if our hearts condemn us when our behaviour falls short, falls short of being loving, that is, then that means our will is good. Our humanity is intact. The driving force of our lives is toward goodness, towards love, toward making life better for other people, not just for ourselves. I believe that is true of most people, almost everyone. It gives us joy to bless other people because that is what we were created to do. But stuff holds us back. Stuff like fear, mostly fear. Fear of being taken in or taken for granted. Fear of giving so much of ourselves that we are left with nothing. Fear of being hurt, fear of doing the wrong thing, fear of getting out of our depth, fear of reaching the limit of our wisdom and resources and having to admit that the problems in the world are way beyond us. So our will calls us to do everything we can to make life better for others, but fear countermands the order of our will at every turn. And so I ask you again, are there any resources in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus that can help us with that dilemma? Now I want you to think about that so I don't want to give you all the answers to that question because it's a question every follower of Jesus needs to answer for themselves. Um, and really, there are as many answers as there are people here. So I will just point toward one answer because this is Good Shepherd Sunday. Jesus is our Good Shepherd. Now we're all clear on that because John 10 comes up so often in the Anglican lectionary. But today I'm going to ask you to think about this. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now that's a very familiar verse from John 10, so familiar that we don't necessarily see the absurdity of it. What, I ask you, is the good of a dead shepherd? How could the sheep benefit from the shepherd throwing himself at the lion that is attacking them? The lion will eat the shepherd, the shepherdless sheep will scatter and be easy prey for the lion and all the lion's friends to pick off one by one. Isn't that what fear says to us when it urges us not to love? Why put yourself at risk? What good will, it, will you be to people who want your help if, um, if you get eaten by a lion? Much better to stay safe. But Jesus did not stay safe. Jesus walked right up to the lion and said, do your worst. And it did. What is the good of a dead shepherd? Well, we got our answer on Easter Day, did we not? The shepherd passed through death and showed us that it is not the end. For death does not get the last word. Love does. Our world is feeling a lot of fear at the moment. It's been a rough five years for everyone and some 
much more than others. Given what our entire world has been through, fear is utterly natural. But fear does not keep us safe. Fear cannot keep us safe. Only love provides safety. Our friends in Sydney are reeling right now after two stabbings in three days. We're all reeling. And we might ask, where was the good shepherd in all that? Where was love? Not in the violent mob outside the Good Shepherd Church, intent on vigilante justice. Love, love wasn't there. Love is never there. Safety is never there. Only more violence, more fear. Where was the Good Shepherd last week in Sydney? Well, in the mind of the man with first aid training who had found himself a safe place but then saw a woman who would die without help. And he left that safe place in order to save her. In the hands of the people who took an injured baby out of the arms of a dying mother and made sure that baby survived. And in the determination of a police officer who ran toward danger in order to protect the public. Love is not about making un, about taking unnecessary risks, but it is about focusing on the needs of others so much that our own safety is no longer our primary concern. When fear warns us about where we might end up if we choose to love, the resurrection of Jesus tells us that wherever we end up, in life or in death, our shepherd has been there, our shepherd will be there with us to provide for us, to protect us. So sisters and brothers, love one another. The Lord, the Good Shepherd, is with you. Amen.